morning. We're so glad to um, have you join us and log in with us for our um, virtual uh, community meeting. And um, we're excited about what's taking place here in Medina. And we're so glad to have our panel with us today. Uh, I am Pastor Arthur A. Ruffin Sr. from the Second Baptist Church in Medina. Uh, and before we start, I'm going to open up with prayer. Uh, and then I'm going to have our panelists um, introduce themselves. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for another day. We thank you for just the fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for uh, the things that you are allowing us to do here in the city of Medina, and we pray that you would bless our, our leaders, that you would give them strength, that you would give them courage, uh, that may we may walk away in the way that your word have defined for us to do. So bless us today, and that whatever we say and do will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, once again, we're so glad to have everybody join us. Um, we do have some questions that we're going to go over. Uh, but first, we want to introduce um, our panelists today so that you can see uh, who is on our panel, uh, and then we'll move from here. So I'll start with my left, uh, and then we'll just go all the way around the room. My name's Ed Kinney. I'm the police chief for the city of Medina. My name's uh, Dennis Hanwell. I'm the uh, mayor of the city of Medina. I'm the safety director, and I've uh, been with the city for 37 years. All right. My name is Ashley Powell. I am Vice President of Sister Circle Medina. Um, I belong to Second Baptist Church here in Medina, and I also work for the Medina County Health Department. I'm Reverend Michael Wilson. Um, I'm actually the founding pastor of Strong Tower Christian Fellowship and Ministries, presently working with Fellowship Baptist Church with Pastor Peterson. All right. So glad to have all of you today. Um, this is our first time getting together. Um, so um, take a deep breath. Exhale. Uh, we're going to be OK. Just pretend that nobody's watching us. Um, we are here to have a city discussion. Um, because we cannot get the, the whole community together, um, we thought it would be a good idea uh, to go virtually and grab some people um, that have positions in the city uh, that we can talk about some of the things that are going on um, in our world today, not just Medina, but in our world. And we know that a lot of people have questions. Uh, we know they have questions about the police department. Uh, they have questions about the city, what we're doing, what's the government doing. Uh, people are curious about how residents are doing. Uh, and then they also want to know what the churches are doing. Um, so instead of me speaking on that behalf, uh, we've grabbed uh, the chief, we've grabbed the mayor, uh, we've grabbed Ashley, we grabbed Warren Wilson, and we was like, we will let them answer those particular questions um, before we get to these that were sent to us. Um, I think one of the major questions is, as we look around the world today, um, we see that African Americans are being killed daily, uh, and the people are asking the question, what type of police department departments do we have these days? Um, most people watch the news and they see that um, almost in every big city, um, people are being killed and police are being crooked. Uh, and they equate that to the city of Medina, uh, because people think that every department has to be dirty. Um, but we come today and want to clarify that there are good policemen. Uh, is that right, Chief? Yes, sir. That's correct. Right. There, there, are, there are good policemen. Um, but we know in anything that we do, there's always a bad apple. There's always a bad apple in everything. Uh, and we always try to weed out that bad apple. Um, so I'm going to go around the room uh, briefly, and I'm going to ask some questions that some of you may be thinking about uh, and that you might have sent in. And we're going to see if we can answer some of your questions. Um, I'm going to start with our police chief, um, Ed Kinney. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with you. We've had the privilege of sitting down and talking about some things. Um, I think I've asked you some tough questions um, that I did not know or was not aware that our police department was doing. Um, so I think to start off, Chief, one of the questions would be, um, what is the policies of our police department, and how can citizens of Medina find out what the criteria is for our police? 
Well, they can call uh, everything, essentially everything we do is public record. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, the, the culture of our police department is very service oriented. We follow a uh, community oriented policing mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. And essentially to us, what that means is building partnerships with the community, building mm -hmm. partnerships with the visitors of the community mm -hmm. and building trust in doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to specific policies, mm -hmm. we have uh, a robust policy manual, it's 767 pages. Mm -hmm. It is public record. If anyone has any specific questions about that, mm -hmm. they can call us, email us, and mm -hmm. we'll give them the specific policy that they have interest in. Okay, okay. So if I wanted to know um, what rules and regulations your police department had, um, are they online or do we have to find out as individuals and maybe call in and ask for them? Yes, sir, you could call in and ask for them. Okay. Uh, again, that's a public records request. That's, okay. That's, uh, we have those that information readily available for anyone okay. who calls in or emails. Okay, great, great. All right, thanks, Chief. I'll come back to you. Uh, Mayor Hanwell, we've, we've interacted a lot. Um, I've been here in this city, I think, about four or five years, uh, and we have done a lot together. Um, if somebody wanted to know in the city, what is our city doing based on government things what are we doing to better our city um, in times like these? Or are we just comfortable with, with how we're living? We're uh, constantly looking to improve. Mm -hmm. um, so when I took over as mayor, uh, we partnered with the schools mm -hmm. and uh, brought up a group from Columbus to do some cultural diversity training. Mm -hmm. The police officers have the cultural diversity training and de-escalation through, through the academy, through ongoing uh, classes, but we wanted to do the, the whole city. Mm -hmm. um, so we did uh, all, all of our department heads, all of our supervisors, uh, as, as did the school. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the other thing that, that we've done is every time there's a job opening in the city, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's a parks worker, a police test, uh, we're looking for firemen, whatever. Mm -hmm. I send that uh, to, to you mm -hmm. at Second Baptist, mm -hmm. to Pastor Peterson mm -hmm. at uh, Fellowship to help, help spread the word, to Pam Miller from the Diversity Committee, uh, just to try to help us spread the word in mm -hmm. case somebody doesn't see it online. All the job postings are, are online every time they're up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they may not see it there, they may not see it in the newspaper. So this is just another uh, mechanism mm -hmm. to try to draw folks in, mm -hmm. and, and we found that that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, the chief has always uh, also assigned, uh, since he took over, uh, officers to go to job fairs mm -hmm. in some of the larger cities to promote promote our police department, to mm -hmm. promote our way of policing, to draw in uh, a more diverse uh, workforce as well. Mm -hmm. So the city is constantly looking for different ways to to make us as representative mm -hmm. of the community as we possibly mm -hmm. can be. Okay. Um, being a smaller city, um, We've kind of hit the map since we had our unity demonstration. Um, we've been on the news, we've been in the newspaper, uh, we've been on the radio. Um, is our governor um, aware of what's going on in the city of Medina? Is he aware of the things that we are doing uh, as a community to, to better promote ourselves? Uh, I reached out to the governor's office uh, after we had uh, the five demonstrations in three days okay. and zero problems okay. and, and the methods and um, planning mm -hmm. that, that we worked on to, to bring that mm -hmm. about and offered if he would be willing to come up and meet with us, if mm -hmm. he'd like the chief and I to go down to Columbus and, mm -hmm. and talk about things. Mm -hmm. And I did get a response back from his office. Mm -hmm. he, he's kind of got his hands full with mm -hmm. COVID and, mm -hmm. and other things going on statewide, but mm -hmm. his top policy advisor mm -hmm. is supposed to reach out to me and, and they just have not done that as of yet. Okay, okay. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor Hanwell. Um, Ashley Powell, good morning to you. Mm -hmm. um, glad to have you with us. Um, um, as a young um, single mother, African-American, I believe you've been in Medina probably most of your life. Until you made me go to Worcester. <laughs> until we moved, to, <laughs> until I married your mom and went to Worcester. Yeah. Uh, and then you left and came back. I did. Um, so you've been a resident here uh, most of your life. Um, how 
do you see Medina um, from the time that you can remember who you were um, up until now, seeing that Medina is probably, I think I heard 4% uh, African American. How do, you, how, do you, how do you feel, how do you see Medina right now at the present stage? So I have been here majority of my life in my younger years, all the way up until I was in ninth grade, I went to Buckeye um, schools. Mm -hmm. So I went to York Elementary, which is not there anymore, which is so weird to think about. Yeah. Um, I went to Buckeye Junior High, and I lived in Liberty Plaza, which is a uh, government mm -hmm. um, housing development, mm -hmm. HUD housing development. And you just didn't realize that the world was so different. I, I feel like I lived in this world where people looked like me. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in Medina I knew, or I was related to, they were friends mm -hmm. of friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go to school and people did not look like me. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like it wasn't until I got into junior high, because kids are kids, kids mm -hmm. love. I mean, I mm -hmm. look at my kids all the time playing with people who don't look like them. Um, I had no problems until I got to junior high. At Buckeye High School, on my last day of my eighth grade year, um, me, along with the other six black kids in the school, had to be escorted home by the sheriff's department because there were threats on our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not for any other reason other than the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. And that was the first moment that I realized how different I truly was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're in junior high school, you're not going to want to hear this, mm -hmm. but you think about boys and stuff, that's where you first get into that, mm -hmm. but no one ever looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I had my group of friends, but they were never allowed to come visit mm -hmm. me at my apartment, so I always had to go to their house. Mm -hmm. And so after that instance, nothing happened to those kids. We got to, we got escorted home, our parents threw a fit, and that was it. I had to go back to the high school the next year um, and was called the N-word up and mm -hmm. down the hallway. Nothing happened to those kids. Mm -hmm. And then we moved, and I, even though I went kicking and screaming, Worcester was a different community, and it, it was a good um, experience, mm -hmm. but I can't help but to admit that Medina is always home. Mm -hmm. That was one mm -hmm. instance in, I mean, 13 years of my life that that mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. When I came back here, I knew this is the place I wanted to raise my child. Um, I unfortunately made a decision that led me to become a single mother um, at quite a young age and I tried very hard not to be a statistic mm -hmm. because I wanted to work against the stereotype mm -hmm. that was forced upon me um, so I went to college I got my uh, associate's degree came back here raised my son no problems ever since mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to see that the community has grown there are more African Americans in this community that I'm not related to although I do not know personally mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have made great strides to try to improve the community that we live in um, there are countless amounts of stories that happen within my own family mm -hmm. um, my biological father side of the family and, and um, cousins and close friends that are not my story mm -hmm. um, but I do know that um, it it's not necessarily based on all the time race, mm -hmm. but socioeconomic status as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you don't have the things that you need, you make decisions that are not the same as someone who can just go to the store and get what they need. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at our community today from where I was as a, as a younger child, I think I do definitely see growth in this community. Mm -hmm. um, I love that I can call on the police chief when I have a question or a concern. Mm -hmm. I love that when an officer responds to a disturbance in my neighborhood that mm -hmm. the guy comes and plays basketball with my mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I am very grateful to have um, a place that we can call home here mm -hmm. and feel safe within my community. And I turn on the news and I know that's not the same story for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so being here, I just, I feel grateful, but I also want to push the agenda to, to make people aware that just because it's not here in Medina doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that we don't have the right, mm -hmm. or that we do have the right to still fight mm -hmm. for the equality. And while things are good, that they can always be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Reverend Wilson, yes, uh, you've been here for a while. You've pastored here um, in the city of Medina. Um, you're also helping um, Pastor Peterson at Fellowship. Um, how do you think churches deal uh, with racial injustice? What is what is what is the churches doing, or you believe should be doing uh, in today's times to to help with race? Well, I, I think that. The main thing the church has to do is remember that it is the church. Mm -hmm. And seeing that it is the church, we must uh, acknowledge and do the things of which God tells us to do. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, it's the word of God for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. and, and the word teaches us about these dilemmas that we're having in the world today. Mm -hmm. 
and how really we should treat one another. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, that still we still have the humanistic part of us mm -hmm. that we have to, as Paul would say, mortify and keep in check. Mm -hmm. But I believe that the church's main aspect is to serve God in, through the Word of God and allow Him to help the community mm -hmm. as we step out. Mm -hmm. The word tells us to let our light so shine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be in the word in order to shine. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing with that is, I believe what we're doing now after some of the demonstrations and how all of the pastors are getting together and mm -hmm. this and that, that, that we as a church have to come together as mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Medina, uh, as you well know, there's not but, but two, possibly three mm -hmm. African-American churches mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that being said, we, we've got the blend mm -hmm. so that we can make true unity mm -hmm. come to see. And, and, and as mm -hmm. we kind of teach each other, mm -hmm. we could also go out into the community because we're part of the community mm -hmm. and allow that to teach each other. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of how I look at that. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. 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 All right. One individual question, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of these um, that has been sent in to us. Um, let me start with our mayor. Mayor, probably 10 years ago, would you say um, the city has to be ran, and I don't mean ran, but like govern a little differently now than it was 10 years ago because things have changed? Or is it the same and we're just promoting more? Does, does that make sense? Um, a lot of people may say, um, why isn't there African Americans um, in, the, in the city building? Or why isn't there more policemen? And why aren't there more firemen? And why aren't there more teachers? Um, what, what, what would you respond to that? Why would you say um, maybe there's not? Are they being given the same opportunity as anybody else, if somebody asked you that question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, so with a, a number of the positions, police mm -hmm. uh, stands out mm -hmm. uh, because it's a competitive exam mm -hmm. and it's multifaceted. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they have to be at least 21. Okay. Because uh, you can't be under 21 and have a firearm. Okay. They have to have a valid driver's license. Okay. Uh, but it's a very competitive process. Mm -hmm. When when I took the test uh, back in the early 80s, um, you had to score in the top three. Mm -hmm. And I can remember way back then coming to a, a high school like this and sitting with 600, 800 people. Mm -hmm. And you think about that, mm -hmm. that, that how those numbers have to work out for you. Mm -hmm. um, so the written test is one portion of it. Now that, now that law has changed mm -hmm. to try to be more inclusive, mm -hmm. it changed in the state and it changed in the city that now we get to look at the top 10 mm -hmm. instead of the top three. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody isn't the best test taker, mm -hmm. but if they can still get up into that top 10, that gives mm -hmm. us a broader group of folks to interview and look at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll let the chief address you know, all, all of the different steps of that. Mm -hmm. But in the city, we're trying to encourage people. I want us to have a diverse workforce as much as you all want, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I can't go pick up people in, in the back mm -hmm. of a police car and bring mm -hmm. them in to fill out an application mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or to uh, take mm -hmm. a test. Mm -hmm. All I can do is notify them of mm -hmm. it and encourage them mm -hmm. uh, to take it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I've talked with uh, Jim Shields, who is one of our council members, mm -hmm. is the HR director mm -hmm. uh, for, for Medina City Schools. And uh, Medina City Schools suffers you know, the, the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. They have an opening mm -hmm. and they may have, you know, 15, 18, mm -hmm. 20 applicants mm -hmm. and, and they struggle to even have a minority, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what my hope and prayer is that through the churches, you know, through these community groups, through interactions mm -hmm. uh, of folks you know, mm -hmm. of folks they know, mm -hmm. we can just help spread the word and mm -hmm. try to draw, draw folks mm -hmm. in. And uh, the more, I always tell people when you take these tests, you know, because I, I took a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was taking them in multi-states. Mm -hmm. um, and you, uh, the more you ta take, mm -hmm. the better you get mm -hmm. in doing it. Mm -hmm. In fact, just a, a little personal discrimination story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I tested for the uh, U.S. Secret Service. Mm -hmm. um, I only had a two-year degree at the time instead of a four-year degree that I have now. Mm -hmm. But all you could do is the White House uniform police mm -hmm. with that. But mm -hmm. I thought that would be a, a good start and an interesting job. Mm -hmm. So um, I took that. I went over to 
Pittsburgh. Uh, I went through the whole interview process, everything. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, the very end, uh, they asked me, was there anything we asked you uh, or did not ask you that you thought we would. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you really didn't bring up anything you know, health related. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm insulin dependent diabetic. I have been since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And phew, that was it. Okay. You're done. Okay. You're done. Um, and most police departments in our, in our county mm -hmm. and in our state, mm -hmm. I, I even went over to Virginia, um, and uh, they wouldn't take you with, with mm -hmm. if you were insulin dependent. Mm -hmm. And it, it was only through, uh, through God's grace that the police chief, which was Homer Davis at the time, mm -hmm. his physical or his primary care physician mm -hmm. was my primary care physician. Mm -hmm. And when, when I had the interview with, with um, Bill Lamb as the mayor and the police chief, I told them, look, mm -hmm. in fact, I do today. Mm -hmm. I, I just keep some hard candies in my pocket. Mm -hmm. If I need mm -hmm. to eat something and I can't get away because I'm dealing with something on the police force, mm -hmm. I can eat one of those hard candies mm -hmm. that will tide me over for mm -hmm. an hour, two hours. Okay. So that my doctor certified that right. to, to Chief right. Davis and to um, Bill Lamb, and they mm -hmm. gave me an opportunity that, mm -hmm. that no other community gave me. Okay. Okay. Can I, yes. I ask a question? Yes. So we're talking about um, people getting minorities and uh, making a more diverse workforce and things like that. This is not my story, but I know that through conversations that some people just don't feel comfortable or welcomed in our city and in our workforce. And so I've been fortunate enough to have conversations with um, people in this city, and I know that um, it is welcoming. But what do you think we can do to, to let other minorities know that the story that happened to you back in 1995 is not the same uh, employees and workforce that you're dealing with today and, and that we do welcome diversity? Mm -hmm. I can answer that. Okay. For the police department, diversity is very important within our ranks. I think it's important that the police department reflect the community makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as the mayor mentioned, we do go to college uh, job fairs. We go to job fairs throughout the region. And, uh, we interact with, with people and uh, we participate in the diversity group. And when we do have a position available, we send out the applications to local academies. We send it to the diversity gr group. And we ask people in the community to advocate on our behalf for minor minority hiring. Uh, have people come and take our test, advocate for us, say Medina is a great town, come and work in Medina. It's important that we have diversity. The more diversity we have, the better perspective people have, the more that they can engage and converse and hear different stories. It's, it's very important. So to that end, uh, we actively seek minority candidates uh, for our civil service testing. Uh, we recently, within the last year and a half, did hire our first uh, black female officer. Uh, we've not had that in the past, so we're making steps towards that, that end goal, and, and hopefully we can continue in that direction. Mm -hmm. and if I may just add to that, mm -hmm. Pastor, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we try to do, not only with our police officers, but myself, uh, our councilman, is. Um, to get out into the minority community and interact with folks, mm -hmm. so we've had mm -hmm. you know barbecues mm -hmm. over over at uh, Mellert Park, mm -hmm. and uh, what better way to, to just mm -hmm. sit at a picnic table and chat with somebody, and, mm -hmm. and it's non-confrontational, mm -hmm. you know, on both sides mm -hmm. because uh, you know no, nobody's on edge, nobody's worked up. Mm -hmm. Get to know one another mm -hmm. a little bit and and understand mm -hmm. their perspective. That's what I mentioned at the Unity Rally. I, th mm -hmm. I think. A, a, a part of the problem for me as a white person is I don't experience what you experience, mm -hmm. uh, what you two both have experienced. Mm -hmm. So I try to educate myself, you know, with, with reading. I try to talk to people mm -hmm. and understand. Uh, it, it troubled me mm -hmm. when, when Ashley, you shared in a meeting with the, the chief and I and, and Pastor Ruffin and your mother that you know, your son going to Target with another young man mm -hmm. was concerning and you had to have some cautions for him mm -hmm. to, to simply go up the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that, you know, my children who are adults now, but mm -hmm. I would never have to have a conversation mm -hmm. if they wanted to go up to the stop and go and buy a soda or mm -hmm. a candy bar or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So I, I feel that if we listen to those things and find ways to, to help improve uh, and and uh, move forward in a positive direction, then then we're all learning from from you, so we don't make those same mm -hmm. mistakes again. Mm -hmm.
Thank mm -hmm. you. I really appreciate both of your responses. It mm -hmm. was, it's real, and that's what people need to see. Because right. so often, especially like even in my own place of employment, in, in most professional places, you have um, a checklist of things you need to accomplish in a year, right? Like we have to take uh, defensive driving, and you have to. Um, uh, do certain things in class action, talking about culturally linguistic um, act and diversity. And um, I help credential dentists and doctors and, and all the insurances, they have to take these classes about diversity and things. But so often I feel like it's just a checkbox. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can say we did that. But to hear you both answer those questions, you can tell that you said um, how important it was to bring everybody's stories to the workforce and how important it was for you to have that conversation to understand where we're coming from. So thank you for answering that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I yes. ask one question, too, yes. uh, in regards to the tests that they take? Are there any study materials out that they can look at to kind of get an idea of what these tests are kind of like to kind of get them prepared? See, because a lot of people struggle with going to something that they don't know nothing about. You know, it, if they have a little more comfortability to it, it might help out getting people to come because then they don't feel, I don't want to say as challenged, but as challenged mm -hmm. when they come. There are no study materials provided by the city. However, what you can do is go out and seek uh, study guides for civil service tests. And mm -hmm. there are general civil service test study guides mm -hmm. that if, if you take the initiative and you go online and look, you can, you can buy those study guides. Uh, on a little side note, that's what we I did for my promotional <laughs> exams. Uh, uh, knowing that the city didn't provide any uh, study guides for the promotional exams, I went out and found the uh, the companies that provide these tests, and they have study guides, mm -hmm. and they they. Uh, Basically, obviously, it mm -hmm. doesn't give you the answers, right. mm -hmm. but it, it gives you study tips on mm -hmm. how to study, books to read, and mm -hmm. uh, study guides based on the books, the mandatory reading material for our mm -hmm. promotional exams. Mm -hmm. So so there are avenues out there that, that people who want to take the initiative to study can do so. Mm -hmm. And I know back, back when I was taking the tests, uh, even our local library, Medina Library, Medina County Library, they had some sample tests that were no longer being used, so you could kind of get used to how they're framing questions and things. Uh, and then now, of course, everything's digital, mm -hmm. right. so you know you you, mm -hmm. you know you could get online and mm -hmm. put in you know mm -hmm. sample civil service tests or civil service questions for police officer, for firemen, for whatever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. and um, find so much without even leaving your house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if I recall, I, it's been quite a while since I've taken a, an entry level civil service test, but I think mm -hmm. it was basic knowledge like reading comprehension, mm -hmm. some basic math, um, directions, being able to follow directions, driving directions, things like that. So some of it you can't really study for, right. it's just general mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's let's stay there for a minute, um, because I know um, Mayor Henwell. When there is a job opening, you do send me a post. Uh, I can see them. They go out to different places, and we try to promote that. Um, and most most of the city jobs are civil service tests. Is that correct? Most. Uh, I wouldn't say most. A lot okay. of the laborers, like uh, when, when I. Uh, so we have a Teamsters okay. union, okay. and that includes uh, parks, water, s street department, mm -hmm. service department, uh, forestry, the cemetery workers. Mm -hmm. So it's all one big group. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we have them all in one union instead of separate unions mm -hmm. is then that gives us flexibility mm -hmm. if we need to move folks around or if they want to bid. Mm -hmm. So let's let's say it's a part-time laborer and now a full-time laborer comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be at the cemetery, but they can bid on a job over in the water department or the street okay. department. Okay. And, um, we, we like that flexibility both from a management standpoint and, and from their standpoint. And some of the folks that I've talked about, you know, they tell me, well, I'm not really interested in part-time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd like to come in at, at right. full-time with right. benefits and so forth, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. But through negotiations mm -hmm. with the city years ago, mm -hmm. the way the, the order uh, works in the Teamsters is uh, seasonals, get a first chance for part-time openings. Mm -hmm. Part-timers then get a first chance at full-time openings. Okay. 
So if, if, you, if you're sitting at home waiting for the full-time opening, mm -hmm. you may never get a chance because <clears throat> right. people are just are moving going up, up. Yes. and new seasonals are coming in okay. and they just keep working their way up the ladders. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, and so many times people think, well, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be at that low level and I don't know how long I'll be there. Well, mm -hmm. there are some folks that have come in mm -hmm. and literally within mm -hmm. three to six months mm -hmm. could be up into a full-time position because mm -hmm. you're in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you have the opportunity. If you never come in the door, you don't mm -hmm. have the opportunity. Okay. Okay. Um, for you or the chief, either one. As an African-American, um, if I was to apply for a job in the city, um, what would prohibit me from getting higher? Uh, does that make sense? What, what, what in my life would stop me from being hired for the police or for the city? I, I want to apply for that job that you sent out, but I'm thinking about what I'd done when I was 16, what I'd done when I was 18, what I'd done when I was 24. I wonder if I'd go apply for this job. They're going to pull up my record. They're going to just shoot me out, throw me out. What would prohibit me from being allowed to be in that process of being hired. Does that, does that well, make sense? I'll talk generally and then I'll let the okay. chief talk about the police department because it's more restrictive with them. Okay. But generally everybody has to, has to have a driver's license Okay. Um, because you may have to move a vehicle okay. or, or, or it's necessary for the job. Uh, the other thing is you have to be insurable. Um, you, so I might have a driver's license but because I've had a DUI or two DUIs and mm -hmm. three DUIs in the past, mm -hmm. the, the city won't. Uh, the city insurance company will not accept you, and okay. obviously we can't have you driving a city vehicle if you don't have any insurance. Okay. So um, those would be kind of the broad general mm -hmm. restrictions, mm -hmm. and then of course the the police. It gets a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. with background. So okay, I'm gonna come to him. So for the city, is there anything that I may have been convicted of that would hinder me from getting hired? Does that make sense? Like if I was committed of, of theft or forgery or check fraud or shoplifting, would that would that stop me from being on a city? Not, job. No, not necessarily in and of itself. A number of things are looked at. Okay. You know, how long ago was it? Okay. You know, was the record sealed? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, what, what position are we, are we bringing you in for? Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of different things that we look at, and um, if the person hasn't, we'll, we'll make those recommendations to them. Okay. That, look, you can, you can go after, after, you know, it's in the ORC. I, okay. I don't know if it's two years. It depends if it's a misdemeanor or a felony okay. or whatever it is. But you can get those records sealed or expunged okay. uh, as long as the prosecutor doesn't object to that. Okay. And then you don't even have to report it once, once that happens. Okay. Um, so okay. for the city as a whole, we, we still want to look at that person. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it wouldn't automatically reject them, but uh, it, it causes some questions, obviously, okay. right? Okay. Because if, if, if you've stolen before, and particularly recently, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. are, we, are we at risk of bringing you in and, and mm -hmm. may, maybe things are going to become missing, you know, mm -hmm. City mm -hmm. Hall or mm -hmm. whatever? I'm not saying that Correct. always happens, Correct. but, Correct. you know, like any employer would, we, ha we have to evaluate that person along with, with other persons that may or may not have that on their record. Correct. So, so let's, let's keep going for a minute. So, so if, I, if I did something and it was on my record, um, and say it was maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, and I look to appear to be a good candidate, would you, would you confront me and say, hey, you, you're looking good, but why don't you get that seal? Um, and that'll do, do you, do you, I don't know what's a good word to say, do you, do you like help them move forward because they've had a bad pass or because I've had a bad pass? But does it ever happen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. In, okay. In fact, not only for us, but other employers. Okay. Look, if you have the ability to seal that or expunge it, okay. and not have to report it. Okay. Not only for us, for anybody in in your future, it's okay. better to have that behind you. Okay. Um. So so yeah, we would encourage them to do that. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that that we would never hire somebody right. that would have something like right. that on the record. It just depends on the position. Okay. And, okay. and like I say, how long ago it's been. I mean, we've all made mistakes as yes. juveniles and yes. things like that. And, okay. and you know, okay, so you shoplifted a candy bar, mm -hmm. you know, when you were 16, mm -hmm. you're, you're 25 or you're 30 or whatever, haven't been in any trouble since. Okay. Uh, you've got a good work record, all these mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't see where that would prohibit you from being mm -hmm. hired. Okay. Okay. All right, Chief. And, and we, 
much the same for us. We look at it collectively. Obviously, we have to look at certain issues when it comes to theft, drug use, okay. uh, prior criminal history. Uh, for us, obviously, if you've been convicted of domestic violence, you're not allowed to possess or carry a handgun. So obviously, that would mm -hmm. be a, a disqualifier. Mm -hmm. Any type of felony would be a disqualifier. Mm -hmm. Any recent uh, drug use would be a disqualifier. Any felony drug use would be a disqualifier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, and it's it's important for us that we maintain high standards mm -hmm. so that we don't get those bad apples and that we don't have those potential uh, civil liabilities, mm -hmm. uh, potential embarrassments that come into the department. So we have a, uh, a thorough hiring process that starts with the civil service test. Once that candidate passes the civil service test, they then go to a pretty difficult physical agility test mm -hmm. uh, that weeds out typically 50% of the candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, of those candidates that pass, then they go to a, an initial interview with a detective mm -hmm. who they go over the background information, any financial uh, issues, any credit issues, foreclosures, mm -hmm. things like that, uh, criminal history. Mm -hmm. Uh, once, once they move from that, they go to a, a panel interview with the uh, lieutenants and, and myself, and sometimes we have some patrol officers that come in to, to get their perspective as well. Uh, at that point, we find a uh, successful candidate or candidates. We offer a conditional job offer, and essentially what that is is we, we offer the job, but it's conditional to the polygraph and the psychological assessment. So after that offer, they go through a uh, pretty in-depth uh, polygraph examination, and it essentially goes into their background, uh, their criminal history, their drug use, a uh, uh, whole litany of, of questions that they ask. Uh, once they pass that, then they move on to the psychological assessment, which is a, a very in-depth psychological assessment, and that's where they uh, they, they weed out anybody that for the purpose of our com conversation that has any race bias issues, that uh, th there's a potential for somebody to take their implicit bias and allow that to manifest into their decision making. So they, they test for that and they look for that and if, if somebody shows those indications, they give us a, a not a good fit. It's, it's either a good fit or not a good fit. And uh, if they're not a good fit, we don't hire them. If they're a good fit, they continue through the process, which then is the full uh, background investigation by our detective bureau. And then uh, the last step is a, a medical examination by a doctor. And then they're, they're hired on. They start a 12-week field training program with a, a full-time officer, an FTO, field training officer. Uh, it's a minimum of 12 weeks. And during that time, they're also on a one-year probationary period. So there's, there's several steps throughout this entire process that, that they're consistently and constantly evaluated on, on their performance. But uh, back to your original question, there, there's several factors that we look at when it comes down to actually offering that position. And uh, s some of those that I mentioned earlier are automatic disqualifiers. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just, just a quick thought that's been on my heart as y'all were talking. Um, and I think you may have answered it, Chief, in a little bit, but let me just put it out because of the nature of what we're doing here. Uh, in that is as as if I was coming or I were coming out to do this Should I feel as an african-american? Okay, should I feel that although I've heard what you said if I do this and let's just say myself and somebody else that's not like me comes and we have this same kind of thing going on that I'm going to not get it because of who I am and they'll get it because of who they are. Is that an issue? Would that become an issue uh, in, in the arena that we're talking about? Because I want to feel that if I come out, then hey, I got just as fair a chance as anybody else. So is that? So the question that you posed, you prefaced it with as a black man. Mm -hmm. and, and I meant to address that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what color, race, mm -hmm ethnicity, religion, it doesn't matter. Everybody's on an even playing field when they come to take our test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The best candidate gets it at the end of the day. Okay. Did you have some? Yeah. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me stick with you for a minute, Chief. Um, we're, we're seeing so much on the news uh, and in the newspaper about how police um, are treating um, African Americans, um, not only that, but anybody in general. Um, 
after seeing so much on the news, and if somebody here in Medina would say, what is the restriction of force on an individual? Um, I guess they would ask two questions. One, uh, is the city of Medina allowed to use the chokehold, number one? And number two, if I was your partner and I saw you attack the mayor and you did something that was unjust and I just stood there and watched, could I get in trouble for just watching? I can answer both those okay. questions. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, the first one, the chokehold, no, that's that's not a, uh, a practice that we teach our officers and that is not a uh, an accepted hold to restrain somebody. The second question is what's called duty to intervene and we do have a policy that if an officer witnesses another, another officer using undue force or stepping over that line, they have a duty to intervene and stop that officer from doing so. Uh, if they do not, they're in violation of that policy and it is it is spelled out in our policy manual. Okay. So is the chokehold, I guess I would say, is it illegal? I guess that's a good word. Is it? Can I lose my job for doing that, or is that like discretionary? Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. Okay. It's not illegal. Okay. It is something that we don't train. Okay. So it's, it's possibly I could not lose my job if I did it. Yes, sir. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. 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 All right. One again, Pastor, out yes. of fairness. It, it depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if this person is on top of the officer mm -hmm. and the officer either lost his gun or he can't get to his gun, mm -hmm. but now deadly force would be validated. Mm -hmm. The officer has the right to use deadly force okay. as well okay. to save himself or in that same regard mm -hmm. if he's trying to choke out somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now we try to do everything that we can. Uh, in fact, that's what the policy is based on with a minimal amount of force necessary. Mm -hmm. so, so we're trying to keep it as low as we possibly can. Okay. But if the officer has to save his own life, save Ashley's life, because mm -hmm. this person is literally straddling mm -hmm. her and trying to choke her mm -hmm. to death, mm -hmm. then we have to do Whatever. what we have to do to okay. save her life or to save the officer's okay. life. Okay. If, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Now, good, now good out good of fairness for the listeners, because I know we've had offline yes. talks about this, a lot of the things that are being asked across the country now for police forces to do are things we've had in place mm -hmm. for over two decades. Mm -hmm. While I was the police chief and now as the safety director and, and under Chief Kinney's leadership. Mm -hmm. We also have a use of force form that not only if the officer uses force, but even threatens the use of force. Mm -hmm. So if the officer takes his taser out and tells somebody, look, if you don't comply, put your hands up, you know, drop drop the stick, whatever's going on. Uh, if that works and they don't have to tase him, that doesn't mean they don't still have to fill out the form. So if they threaten to use a pepper spray or uh, mace or uh, whatever, if they threaten the use of the taser, if they have to unholster their gun mm -hmm. and the person puts their weapon down and the officer reholsters the gun, each one of those things are reviewed internally uh, because we, wanna, we want that data. We wanna see what's working, uh, what what's flags, you know, is 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 there a situation where uh, maybe an officer is filling out more of these forms than anybody else on their shift? And it could be just the circumstances. He's been on more domestics. He's been at, at, at more bar fights. He's been at, you know, weapons calls. Mm -hmm. But, but if you don't gather the data to look at it, then you can't make that, that evaluation. So we try to do a, a good job of that. Okay, okay, okay. I think, um, if mm -hmm. I may, um, it's hard to, I'm glad you used the, the example that an officer on top of someone choking someone because so often, as you guys see in our, in our media, a lot of times uh, people, and particularly black individuals, are um, suffering from use of deadly force for reasons even when they're unarmed or when they're not uh, necessarily trying to harm another police officer. And so, um, you know, again, we're fortunate here in Medina. Um, but it is something that has, which brought us all here together today. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where that deadly force is being used when it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that to hear that Medina Police Department in, in our city is um, making efforts to identify these things. And I also want to point out that data is important and to follow up on things are important because it's so sensationalized. Um, we all can hop on the bandwagon and, and, and sometimes for good reason, but it's important to look at the facts behind things because sometimes we don't know the whole story. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that. Okay.
two more questions for you, Chief, and then we're going to get into these. Um, because I think these are questions that people have kind of thrown out. Um, one, can you, can you explain to uh, the audience how a taser works? Can you, can you explain? I can. A, a taser, there's two ways that you can use a taser. Uh, obviously, uh, the suspect has to meet a certain criteria before we can use a taser on that individual. Um, actively resisting arrest would be one of the reasons why we can use a taser on, on an individual. Uh, one manner of it is you pull the taser out, you pull the trigger, and two barbs that are connected, the wires come out. And they uh, stick into the skin and they deliver an electric shock mm -hmm. and that disables the individual for up to five seconds. Okay. The other way is a drive stun in which you take the uh, cartridge that, that contains the probes off and you can use the probes mm -hmm. and, and do a, what's called a drive stun. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not as effective as the, uh, the probes are, mm -hmm. but it's essentially a pain compliance technique. Okay. 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 How many times can you shoot that? The probes once. Okay. That's it. Okay. So, so once the, the taser is fired with the probes, okay. uh, that's it. Uh, if the probes are in the person, you cycle it for five seconds and the probes are still there, you can cycle it for another five seconds if, if okay. required. Okay. Okay. Second question. If you stopped me on a, on a stop um, and you did what you did and I came to the mayor's office and I complained about the stop that you stopped me on. And I have a different response to what you wrote up. How can he find out who's telling the truth? Well, this is, this is one thing that uh, hopefully the audience can understand from this meeting is that we have body cameras. Mm -hmm. And we've had body cameras since 2013. Mm -hmm. And we've had car cameras probably since the mid 90s mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in our cruisers. Mm -hmm. Our officers are mandated anytime they have any type of interaction with the public that they have the, the body cameras running. Mm -hmm. So we can easily go back, review that traffic stop mm -hmm. from the, uh, the officer's perspective from his body camera, which they typically wear mm -hmm. right on their chest. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen examples mm -hmm. of, of what the body camera mm -hmm. footage looks like. Mm -hmm. It's high definition mm -hmm. footage with audio, video, mm -hmm. and, and it tells an unbiased story. Mm -hmm. It is, it's great. I saw it um, last week and uh, I think I asked you the same question um, because a lot of people tend to think you're gonna believe the police because those are your, your guys. You know, they work for you and I know what they've been through. So I think I posed the same question. Um, what if I came up to you and I said, you treated me wrong and you said this and you said that and you slap me and then we come to watch the tape and everything that happened was right there on that tape, mm -hmm. everything. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a great device to have. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't know that the city has that. Uh, and it will, it will deter a lot of people from maybe making uh, wrong comments that, that really didn't happen. Um, so they do have an, uh, a right to come in and, and see that. Who would they come to? The mayor or would they come to you? They can call the police department and, okay. and set up an appointment with me. It, it truly is an unprecedented uh, device of transparency, yes. unprecedented device of accountability. Okay. Uh, it, it tells the whole story. Okay. So who stops us in the city of Medina? Who can, who can, who can literally stop us in the city of Medina outside of the Medina police? Because I think a lot of people think when they say I was stopped by the police, they think everybody is the Medina police. Right. Um, so so who, who, who can stop us in the city of Medina? So there's several ju different jurisdictions around us, but specifically in Medina, obviously the Medina police mm -hmm. can enforce traffic laws in the city of Medina. Mm -hmm. The Ohio State Highway Patrol can enforce traffic laws in the city of Medina, mm -hmm. as well as the county sheriff's office. Okay. They, can, they can enforce traffic in the city of Medina as well. There are also some other other details, uh, task forces like the OVI task force, mm -hmm. the, uh, the DUI task force, uh, that that encompasses all the departments in the county. Mm -hmm. And if they're working a specific detail, say they're they're uh, concentrating on the city of Medina, mm -hmm. you may get stopped by a Medina Township or a Montville Township, okay. or or a civil officer. But those are are very rare, and they're only when those specific details are are scheduled. And uh, currently, that OVI enforcement team is is not active at this point. Mm -hmm. So so typically it would be Medina Police, State Patrol or the Sheriff's Office. Okay. Okay. So for your your benefit and, mm -hmm. and the viewer's benefit, the only way they have the authority to do that is that the sheriff, Medina County Sheriff, has to swear them in as special deputies 
for the OVI, for the drug task force, for the whatever, because otherwise Medina Township has no authority in the city of Medina. So when, with these task forces, it's not like, oh, just because you're on a task force, you automatically get this. You actually have to get a second oath of office from the sheriff to give you countywide jurisdiction then. And what it is is just trying to take available manpower and use them as effectively and as efficiently as we can. And what they're looking at is problem areas. Maybe we're having traffic crashes, serious traffic crashes with injuries or deaths mm -hmm. for DUIs, mm -hmm. so they'll target that particular mm -hmm. area of road and try to monitor those things. Okay. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because those are things that people ask and they really don't know. Um, and so they would always say, you know, I got stopped by the Medina police. Well, it wasn't really the city of Medina. You just got stopped by a police officer, right. you know, and they equate that to us and say, well, we were treated wrong. They did this. They did that. And, and we want them to know that if they feel that they were mistreated, they have a right to call here and mm -hmm. say, hey, listen, this happened to me, blah, 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 blah. And then they could set up a meeting and actually mm -hmm. see what happened. Um, I thought it was amazing when I saw it, I was like, wow, you know, if I ever wanted to do that, I couldn't do that because they, they got me, you know. You know how we get mad and we just want to say, oh, man, Chief did this and he did that, and we come in and watch it. Then I have to sit there and look at, oh, man, he didn't. And the first thing I probably say, oh, you cut a piece of that out. You, you took that out. But that's, that's, that's great information to know. That is. All right? It's important to note as well that we cover Lafayette Township through a policing contract also. Okay. So you, you will see Medina City Police officers in Lafayette Township as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions that you have for anybody here before we get into these? Anybody? Yes. If I was to come up and say, um, and I think about some of the members of different churches that may even thought this, especially the younger ones, uh, are y'all profiling me? Is that a, is that a big issue out there? Because we feel it is. We feel we're getting pulled over because we're being profiled. How would you talk about that how would you what would you say let's put it that way I would say no not being profiled I, and, and that is a, a very a common allegation against against our officers is that people once they get caught doing something they say they've been profiled or they've been targeted driving while black and things like that even in the middle of the night when the officers can't see who's driving the car well, I was caught by a mother uh -huh because her son had recently moved back to town and she was worked up because he had been stopped a number of times by Medina police. And uh, I said, well, let me look into the circumstances. I find out he has no driver's license. And her explanation to me was, well, he didn't roll any stop signs. He wasn't speeding. He wasn't. And I was trying to get her to understand that just driving without a license is a traffic offense in and of itself. There doesn't have to be any other violation. And if the officers know him to see him, uh, then that's, that's something they're, they're, by the oath of office they take to uphold the laws, they're gonna stop him and enforce that. Now we still give the officers wide discretion, whether to, to issue a verbal warning, a written warning, a citation, whether to physically arrest or not arrest, that's, that's all on the officers, but the duty to enforce the laws of the city of Medina is, is something we expect them to do. And that's where those car cameras and the body cameras come into play as well. If somebody says, listen, you just pulled me over because I was black and I was driving through town at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, we can go back and, and look at the body camera and the car camera and say, well, no, the officer actually stopped you for rolling through that stop sign or going through that red light or going left of center. And, and we can we can explain to the individual why exactly they got stopped. Again, because the, the officers per our policy are required to number one, uh, once they initiate a traffic stop to go up, introduce themselves to the driver and explain why they were stopped. So at the, at the onset of every traffic stop, that's explained to the driver. Could I just camp on that for one second? Mm -hmm. So um, I went to a, a training over and I, I believe it was Chicago or Detroit, it was out of, out of Ohio. Um, I was there from Ohio. Maureen O'Connor was there, who's a, one of our Supreme Court justices now. Mm -hmm. At the time, she was a lieutenant governor mm -hmm. and the d a director of public safety for the state of Ohio. Three of us were the only ones there. Uh, I was the police chief at the city at, uh, at the time. 
And what I found out through that conference, one of a number of things, but what I found out through that conference was, and we had trained officers my whole career, that when you went up to the car, you asked for their license and registration and their insurance. Mm -hmm. You don't want to talk about what they did wrong because you don't want to have a roadside trial there. Mm -hmm. You get the paperwork and then we'll have a conversation. Well, when I was up there, what I was informed is that if a minority person is stopped and not told immediately why they're being stopped, they presume the officer doesn't have a reason and he's looking for a reason. And that, that s statement right there was all it took for me to come back to Medina and we changed it. Mm -hmm. That from now on in our, under our community policing model, we're going to go up to the car, hi, I'm Officer Hanwell, I stopped you for this. I, now I need to see your driver's license, registration, and insurance. And then that, that takes that whole argument away. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, I mean, we've probably been doing it for close to two decades now. Yeah, we have, and it truly does right off the bat de-escalate any, any misunderstanding mm -hmm. or situation that you have there. It's, mm -hmm. it's been fruitful. I do have a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you guys have also seen in the, in the current media um, white male or females calling police on black persons doing things that are not illegal, uh, deemed Karens. Um, do you get phone calls like that, uh, Chief, that um, suspicious people in neighborhoods and ended up just being an African-American person uh, doing everyday things? And if so, um, how do you guys handle that? Yes, we do. Um, it, it happens quite often. And it puts us in a bad spot because we're obligated to respond. If somebody calls the police department and they lodge a complaint, whether it be a suspicious person or a suspicious vehicle, we're obligated to respond and investigate that complaint. And, and typically we do in, in the most friendly nature we can. Hey, how, how's it going? Uh, what, what are you up to today? Or, or checking on a car? And we just do it in our typical polite fashion and it, it typically ends well. It's not normally an issue. But that, that is something that happens quite often. Yeah. Particularly in regards to African Americans, or do you think in general? Uh, in general, but uh, African Americans have been called on as well. And there have been occasions where they have been breaking the law or they have been actively involved in some type of, of violation. Uh, and that goes to the say something, or see something, say something adage. Um, I, I wouldn't want to discourage people from doing that. Thank you. So, in other words, whatever call you get, you have to respond to it, yes, regardless of what it is. Yes, okay. Sir. Okay. We're obligated to respond and investigate. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Everybody good? Real quick. Just okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something you said. Uh, I'm just curious. If if someone is stopped and they and they don't understand the fact that it was Mottville or some or or the township police that stopped them and they have this big grave issue they want to bring it back to you mayor or whoever and they go and you guys said no that wasn't us that was so and so would will you or or do you help them get to where they need to go to 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 maybe bring it to the township or whatever so they can work it out do you do you help yes, them yes okay. we do and that happens quite often where somebody may call with a concern about a traffic stop we'll discover that it wasn't a medina police officer that it, it was a, a neighboring jurisdiction or a neighboring mm -hmm. department and we'll give them the phone number of, of the the chief of that department to call and discuss it with them yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. one more and then we go <laughs> so so is it illegal to record a traffic stop on your phone our, on our phone the driver like if you stop us can we pull out our phone and record do we have that right yes okay okay all right does it make sense yeah okay all right i mean because we see, we see different things we see where and this is tv where you're not allowed to record or the officer tell you to put your phone down or to turn that off and um, i think some people have mentioned a couple movies that we've requested and they've watched and where they saw on the TV, the officer told them to put the phone down. And so there's just all of these questions floating. Can, can we record our own conversation? You're permitted to the extent that it doesn't obstruct the officer. So you may have seen people with cameras right up okay. doing, doing this right into the okay. officer's face. Okay. That's, that's not permitted. Okay. 
but other than up that, to the point to where it does not obstruct okay. the officer sure so if you're sitting okay. in your car and you want to videotape okay that'll be the second video okay. that's recording okay so that's perfectly fine okay okay and, and just to clarify is that is that potentially a state issue too in other words if we say now that yes you can and I'm going somewhere else and a, a policeman pulls me over and I go, oh, yes, I can. Will that other place have the same standard? Is this a, is this a, a nationwide standard or is this, this a Medina standard? I, in the state of Ohio, we're a single party consent state. That means that as long as one party is aware that there's a recording being made, it's, it's legal. I can't comment on Pennsylvania or New Jersey or Michigan. Right. I'm not aware of their state laws. But in Ohio, we're a single party consent state, so that's permissible here in Ohio. Right, that's, I just wanted that to get out there for yes. everybody that they know that it may not be that way somewhere else because you're used to that. But yes, sir. Good point. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. Everybody ready? I will, one more question, then I'm going to stop. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you alone. This has nothing to do with this. This, this, is just, this is just a question off the top of my mind. If the speed limit is 25, I've always wanted to know this. If the speed limit is 25, what can I get stopped for over 25. I'm trying to say it without answering it. Does that make sense? Well, legally, you can get stopped for going anything over 25. Okay. But, right. okay. but I, I, let me clarify that because when, when somebody starts a story with, I got pulled over for going one mile an hour okay. over the speed limit, okay. a red flag should go up because that's not happening in Medina. Okay. okay. Or two miles an hour or okay. three miles an hour over okay. the speed limit. That's not happening in Medina. Okay. But you can because you broke the law, Tech, correct? Tech. I mean, because sure. you hear a lot of people say, you're allowed to go five miles over. Well, no, you're not allowed. That's, right. I think that's just something we were taught when we were growing up, you know. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I'm good. So stop stopped at three. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's do a couple of these questions here um, and just chime in if they're not uh, directed towards you. Um, this first one is from a Kimberly J.S. Lewis. Um, and she says, this is an important and necessary conversation to have, bringing together stakeholders across the community for an open dialogue is powerful. Thank you for organizing. Here are three questions, one for each participant. Thank you, Kimberly Lewis. To Police Chief Ed Kinney, your June 15th fairness and equity in policy explains many of the things you are already doing. What new, and she has that underlying, things are you doing because of this national conversation? This engaging with the community, okay. engaging with, with uh, the stakeholders in the community. I've been to several uh, meetings with the pastors in the community. I've had several conversations with members of the community, minority members of the community. I think that's important, having the conversations understanding other people's perspectives. Okay, okay. Um, Mayor Hanwell, unfortunately in some circles from national leaders to individual Facebook posts, the rhetoric and language about demonstrations have been very negative and even close to inciting violence against them. How can you combat the racist and derogatory language and characterization of the people speaking out and demonstrating for equality? Well, I think by the example that we led with the, with the five demonstrations, we had, we had uh, our police department, we had command staff, upper level staff mm -hmm. from police agencies across Medina County there to protect the rights of the demonstrators. Uh, as well as to make sure that people weren't interfering with the demonstrators, uh, to treat them with respect. Uh, the chief met with each of the groups ahead of time to tell them that, that we're, we're going to uphold their constitutional rights uh, to, to demonstrate. Uh, we're not going to let it get unlawful or unruly as, as it did in some other cities. And um, I think by having those conversations, by being there, by being able to ask questions, uh, or answer questions for them as they arose or, or to go quell something because somebody didn't necessarily agree mm -hmm. with what the demonstrator was, was uh, projecting versus what the other person's opinion was to make sure that, that 
that stayed peaceful and, and, and that the parties did not continue to engage or, or have it progress to something more serious. So I, I think our example speaks for itself. Okay. Can I hop in? There? Yes, you can. I, yes. I did want to comment on that. Uh, the approach that I took with those protests, I, I took it as an opportunity to engage with the community mm -hmm. and have conversations. And that's why I invited the chiefs uh, from all the neighboring jurisdictions as well as the sheriff. And they were there because it's not just Medina people. There are people from outside the city of Medina. And I felt it was important to have their law enforcement representatives there so that they could engage them mm -hmm. in conversation and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was very fruitful. Okay. Okay. Can I say something about yes. the demonstration? Yes, you can. So, um, Noticed that everybody stands. Uh, when I say everybody, all the police uh, presence was relaxed and it was engaging. It wasn't uh, defensive. It wasn't riot gear and shields and weapons drawn and crossed arms and you know because your body language says a lot about your intentions. And so the fact that you saw people engaging and uh, particularly black people feeling comfortable enough to go up to you and say, "Hey, this happened to me. What are you going to do about it? Or what do you think about this?" Um, I, I witnessed someone engage for quite a long time in a conversation. Ended up with the business card. I don't know what the result of that was, um, but I think that speaks to our. Our, our city here that during this demonstration that our, our police were willing to listen to gain that perspective and to let us know that that they were here to um, support not not support necessarily every aspect of the cause because everybody has their own reasons for being there but to let them know that they are um, at least willing to listen and to give us the right uh, our First Amendment right so I appreciated that okay um, this one is to me it says to Reverend Ruffin of Second Baptist Church in order to keep the momentum and interact real change, do you feel like it's best to keep the conversation focused on policing or to really open it up to a broader discussion on race and privilege in society? Um, I think to answer that um, the best I can is um, we are talking about it all. Um, we're just not not focused publicly right now. We do have a pastor's meeting uh, where there's about 30, 35 pastors and we meet um, and we're talking about this and we're trying to see how we can get this out to the community uh, without having everybody come together right now, especially during this COVID time. Uh, so we're trying to present it to the community this way uh, until there presents a time uh, where we really all can sit down and have an open discussion on this. Um, does that make sense? Anybody else comment? Yes. And, and along with that meeting, it, 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 it's making a cohesiveness between us. Uh, there's, there's, there's many there that may not have known others. Um, there's many that, for myself, that I've met that are, are new faces to me. Uh, and, and it allows that, that internal, let's get familiar with each other. Because the, the, the more familiar you get with one, you can begin to open up and talk a little better. So I think that that meeting has been come, uh, become real productive, and I think it's going to make a big, big step in, in, in the ongoing overall process of this. And, uh, and we commend you also, Pastor, for uh, hitting that up. Amen. Yes. Um. Sorry. So I think two things. One, it's really cool. I have never attended your pastor meetings, but I've heard the feedback, and everybody is from different denominations. Mm -hmm. This is not just right. Baptist pastors coming together. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. And then um, I think that the church at least can agree on one thing, that, that who God is. And so that commonality already sets a precedent for how the rest of the tone should go. Um, but two, to, to speak to the question, um, I do think it's important that we identify um, more than just to the police uh, reform or uh, policies and things like that. I think it's important that we address other areas uh, for black, the black community. Um, just personally speaking, the last two of three family members that I had to bury, we didn't have any life insurance. Why is that? I don't remember growing up knowing that life insurance was uh, uh, an important part of life and death. Um, I think that there are, you know, yes, we're going to look for people to put in these jobs, but how do they get the job skills in the first place? Um, I think that it's important to 
kind of dig into uh, the black community, and, and maybe that's not necessarily other people's obligation, but kind of taking that on personally or, or within the community, uh, for lack of better words, to give people the tools to be successful. Um, how do we get them the resources they need? How do we um, move forward from this place that we are at right now in our time? And I think that's going to change a lot of people's lives and a lot of people's perspectives and, um, and the crime and, and how we interact with each other. Um, so I do think that the conversation needs to be more than just God is good because yes, he is good. And okay, police, what are you going to do to help us? Like, what are we doing within the black community um, to elevate ourselves? Okay. I mean, that's good because there is a lot that we're covering there. Um, we're, we're also um, acquiring relationships, uh, different pastors that never met different pastors, and we're forming friendships and relationships. And our mayor takes time, and he comes and shares with us. Our chief comes and shares with us. And um, we're trying to do things on, on a face-based level uh, and decent and in order, uh, and then take what we learn and give it to our, our, our congregation and to the people in the community to say, yeah, we're going to cover all of these things, um, but we're trying to take, we're not just dealing with just police, but we're dealing with, with um, racial indiscrimination, and we're talking about all of that, and how does it look to us, and um, it's a conversation that I think a lot of us have really never had, uh, so this thing is new for all of us. Uh, there is no manual that says this is how you do it. We just take it a day at a time, uh, and for us right now, we Thank God that it is it, it is progressing. It's definitely progressing. OK, uh, so Kim Lewis, um, I hope we answered your question. The next one is from Paul Lewis. Um, he says, thanks for the opportunity to submit questions for the panel this afternoon. I'm looking forward to the responses. One question for Reverend Ruffin, Mayor Hanwell and Chief Kenny. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst, how much of a problem is race in policing in America and in Medina? So anybody can grab that that wants. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know that I can attribute a number to that. Okay. Uh, it, clearly, it's an issue nationwide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that... Uh, my perspective here in Medina, it's as big of an issue. Okay. But uh, obviously nationwide it is and some reforms are necessary. Okay. Okay. But as I said early on, Pastor, we're... We're always looking to improve. Yes. So the more conversations we have, the, the more interaction we have, the more um, concerns we hear about, mm -hmm. we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to evaluate them and we're going to do the best we can and, mm -hmm. and make improvements if improvements are, mm -hmm. are are necessary. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I, you know, I've been in Medina County in public safety for 39 years, 37 with the city, mm -hmm. um, and, and the chief uh, has been predominantly here as well. So I don't think either of us can, can say, you know, what's happening in, in mm -hmm. the southern part of Ohio or another mm -hmm. state or mm -hmm. uh, nationally, because um, we, we simply haven't experienced it. I, I can tell you that, that some of the things we see on TV are as shocking to the two of us mm -hmm. as, 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 it are to the, as it is to the general public to, to observe. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we, we, we don't want to see uh, an abuse of force. We don't want to see people hurt uh, that aren't, aren't uh, actively resisting, and um, that amount of force is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're all aligned uh, as as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. But as far as putting a number, I agree with the chief, as far as putting a number on it, mm -hmm. we don't have a, a, a well enough perspective, I don't mm -hmm. think, to, to mm -hmm. judge that. Okay. okay. What about you? You look like you're gonna move on. You gotta I, answer I, 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 I think I would have to agree with them. Um, to say that there is a one to 10 um, would not be fair because we, we have nothing to gauge it on. Um, we know that there is a problem everywhere, even in Medina, but to say that we're a one or we're a 10 would not be fair because we have nothing to base it on. Um, I think we're just blessed enough to not be like the other bigger cities uh, where it's just, it's just crazy. You know, we, we thank God every day that we're not a city where we're burning down our restaurants, our stores, our buildings. You know, we, we haven't got to that point. Point. Um, is racial 
uh, injustice an issue? Yes, it's an issue everywhere that, that I believe everybody's working on. Uh, but to answer uh, specifically, I couldn't say it's a one or a 10. Uh, I would have to say it just depends on whose eyes you're looking through, uh, how you're looking at it, what do you view it as. Um, even as, a, as, a, as an African-American man, I don't think we're where other states are. We're not, we're not bad. We're, we're sitting here today getting along. Uh, you'll find some states that would never have this. You'll find some of those small cities that would never do this, that we don't have time for this. There's bigger things. So I, I think we're doing good and we're working on uh, the issues that we have. And we're just asking everybody to just come in and be part of it and just, just help us resolve this. Um, you guys want to? I would just say one of the biggest things to change is everyone may have to do it. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times we focus on, oh, that needs to be changed, that needs to be changed, and it could necessarily be. But then, too, do you look at yourself, your inner self? Do I need to change? Do I need to work on something? Lord, what are you going to have me to do with this? And, and, and be a part of the experience of moving forward and, and don't become the hindrance of moving forward. Uh, not that your issue may not be a big issue, because it could be. Your issue may be the issue we need to move forward to. But with that, there needs to be the process of, okay, that's the issue. Um, I had a problem with it, but I'm willing to work this thing out with you to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. So we got to do that. And, and especially those of us in the church, we want to make sure that the love of God does that. You know, a, a lot of times people don't like the, oh, here we go, the love of God. Well, I got news for you. If you're, if you're part of the church, it, it's supposed to be there. So you need to, to utilize that and, and, and ask him <laughs> to help you out. Cause I, I know daily I need it. And, uh, and, and we need to pray for each other and, and our, our, our government and our police force and, and, and so that they too can continue to work forward to this. So it, it's a big step that we all do it together. Okay. All right. uh, for Chief Kenny, it says, how often has the Medina policy participated in formal anti-bias and de-escalation training over the past five years? Can you repeat that again? I didn't. How often has the Medina policy participated in formal anti-bias and de-escalation training over the past five years? Okay. I'm not sure when we partnered with the school and we had the uh, cultural diversity training, but. It may have been within five years. Okay, yeah, within. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, we did partner with the uh, Medina City Schools and, and took the uh, cultural diversity training and anti-bias training with that. Uh, as far as the uh, de-escalation, we consistently train de-escalation. And one of our biggest de-escalation programs that we participate in is the crisis intervention training. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that program is designed to give the officers training to deal with people who are in mental crisis and how to de-escalate those individuals so that we have a, a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Renee Wells, and this is addressed to Mayor Hanwell. Renee says, good morning, Mayor Hanwell, and to all the panel members. My name is Renee Wells, and I've been a resident of Medina for 60 years. First, I want to thank you for having this discussion. Mayor, I remember as a child never seeing African Americans nor Latino Latinos working for our police department and very few working in the city office. It was upsetting to listening to former police chief C. Davis Sr. inform us that they were no qualified minorities to fill officer positions. Thankfully, the county sheriffs and Medina JFS have hired a number of minority workers over the years. I recently learned that there was an African-American police officer hired, and I thank you. However, I believe there are qualified minorities living in Medina that have the skills and education to fill some of the positions within the city offices and especially in our schools. We definitely need minority teachers, counselors in every Medina elementary, middle and high school. My question is, what are your plans to bring more diversity in the hiring practices of all city departments? 
I think we talked about yeah, that there yeah, a little I th earlier. I think at the, yeah, at the beginning, yeah. and you know, we continue to to try to um, uh, get them to apply. Uh, we can't speak on on behalf of the schools. The schools have their own uh, methods of hiring and putting notices out, and I, I, I'm just not familiar with that. But you know, in in the city, uh, we we continue to try to uh, draw uh, minority members in, be be it. Uh, folks that live here, or, or for that matter, folks that are, are not even in our county right now, but would like to come work here. Mm -hmm. And um, we would encourage uh, anybody with any interest. Um, I know uh, Ashley mentioned about job skills. You know, it, it really depends on the individual jobs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe somebody's worked at a landscaping mm -hmm. company. They've never worked for the city of Medina, but they've run a a weed trimmer, they've run an edger, they run a lawnmower. Well, a lot of those are transferable skills to come and work in our parks department or our cemetery department. Um, so uh, it, it's not necessarily having, having to have a specific set of skills. Mm -hmm. It's just that the skills, either your experience or the skills can be taught or, or, or some of the skills are transferable. Is there, is there also a posting on the city's website for job openings? Yes, sir. That they can go to? Yes, it's on the civil service page, every okay. single job opening in the city. Okay. And they can always the city go website. to there and yes, look sir. on that every day? Yes, sir. Okay. And it also gives like the job description. Okay. And a part of the job description is, is like if there's a certain requirement. Okay. Like I say, everyone is going to have driver's license. Right. Everyone is going to have insured. Okay. But if you... Um, you know, if you have to have, you know, maybe a, a, a in the water department a particular certification mm -hmm. or license from the state of Ohio mm -hmm. uh, for this, you know, they, they'll have all of that information on there. Okay. All right. Um, we hope that we've answered his question. Um, the next four are from Christine Wilder. And she says, I'm pleased to read about the efforts of our police department and Reverend Ruffin to keep this important dialogue going. It is reassuring that our local demonstrations were peaceful and the police seem to be doing a reasonable job. However, I am sure there is always room for improvement in many areas, and I never feel reassured by living in a predominantly red community. Please speak to ongoing ways that citizens can keep moving things forward in supporting all those who are hurting or in need. Example, what are the black owned businesses and relevant nonprofits in Medina County that we can support? That's, that's, that's one. Is there an answer to that? <laughs> Is there, like she wants to know what are the black owned businesses and relevant nonprofits in Medina that we can support? Um, another one, and we could think on these. What is being done locally to make sure there is good, affordable housing available and well-paying jobs and health care? What do we need done in our schools to be sure minorities are being treated with kindness and justice? Do Medina students have the technology they need to participate in distant learning? Are black people in our community, apart from Reverend Ruffin, being asked what they perceive as their needs? Are they being included in planning and decision making? What needs to improve and how best to do it? Might the Medina Gazette, the Post, social media sites consider providing ongoing and frequent updates about what's being done, what needs to be done? Might someone create a website that would be easily accessible and constantly updated to continue to keep these issues in our mind? Thank you to all who are working hard to create a kinder, better country. All right, Christine, we have some work that you're going to help us do. Um, so those are, those are some of the questions that was, that was, that was out there. Um, I, I think the, the Gazette and the Post and and who else? The other sites can only do what they hear or what they see. Um, I, I don't think we can report on what we don't know or either we'll just be guessing. Um, I mean, help me. All of these are... So I think the most... And, and listen, you spoke to this a little bit earlier. I think the simplest thing is for everyone to do something. Mm -hmm. This is a true story on this moment here. 
I went to Walmart the other day and I had Jacoby, um, the little one, and there was an uh, employee talking about all the stuff going on and he was a white man and I automatically instantly felt it within myself to be defensive. And he was talking to a, a white lady and they were just having regular dialogue about current events. And I was like, oh, this is not going to go well. This is not going to go well. And I have taken a hiatus from Facebook just because it is so mm -hmm. discouraging to read all the comments mm -hmm. and um, to see people not get it. Um, and then so turns out that they were actually having a, a very good, a good discussion. And it was something that I particularly would agree with because I agree with it. I don't know, but the fact that I had that thought in my head and I already felt in my, in my mm. stomach that this is going to be a bad conversation, <laughs> and I automatically assumed because it was a white man talking to a white woman mm. that they were already going to disagree with me and look at me crazy when I walked by is a problem. Mm. And it's a problem that I had to be honest with within myself. Why did I feel that way? Mm. Um, and so I think just being honest with ourselves is the first step. Um, there are some really good um, nonprofits and businesses in our county. For one, um, if you haven't had Waffle Waffle, those waffles are amazing. Um, what is her name? Oh my gosh, I just forgot it. Somebody in Facebook world, I can see the comments now. Help me out here. Um, what is that? Layla. Layla. Okay, thank you so much. Her waffles are good. Um, as far as nonprofits, Let's Make a Difference has been around mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, right. Michelle Powell runs that. Yep. Um, Sister Circle, Medina, is another uh, black nonprofit in our community um, that are doing good works. With Let's Make a Difference, it's um, with Sister Circle, it's for women um, and also youth as well. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now what? In mm -hmm. the branch of Sister Circle, Medina. Um, these are all, you, they have Facebook pages and websites if you want to check them out. Uh, maybe we can add something to this feed mm -hmm. for links for these different places. Right. Um, but it's more than just patronizing them and visiting a website. I think we just have to push the conversation more than, um, okay, I'm going to go and, and click a like here. Like, it's more of, uh, she asked some really tough questions. So, you know, what do we do to move it forward other than these things? Mm -hmm. But I think the first step is to check within yourself. Yeah, I think we have to meet people where they are. Um, and not just look, but investigate the opportunity and see where can I put myself into that place? Um, because I think right now, everybody's focused on like the negative, the bad, because it's so much, and that's all we see on CNN. I had to take a break from CNN. Um, I'm, I'm a CNN buff. I would watch it morning, day, noon, night, uh, and I get discouraged, and you know, I'm like, okay, enough is enough, you know? And then finally, you see something that people don't post, uh, a good example is uh, we were going to dinner yesterday. I was taking my family to dinner, um, and, and my grandson, Isaiah, was saying, Papa, the police was down the street um, yesterday at this house, and, you know, they always have them, some whatever, whatever, whatever. But guess what happened? And I'm thinking, oh, please don't. I'm thinking, I'm thinking this in my mind, not nothing bad. He was like, the policeman came around the corner, and we had a basketball. We was playing basketball. And he stopped, and we looked, and he got out the car, and he said, give me the basketball. And and he starts shooting with us. He said, how cool was that? You know, and kids is like, okay, now they have a different view of the police that they're not what we see on TV. They're not violent. That man actually stopped, got out of his car, took his time and came over and said, let me shoot with y'all. And so now they're like, oh yeah, we gonna work you because you can't do nothing. And they, they feel good. And, and this is not what kids are used to seeing. So there is good things that go on with, with some policemen, you know? So I think we have to just change our focus and say, we're not gonna just dwell on the bad all the time uh, because there is good that's going on, okay? So, uh, Christine, we hope that we helped you. Uh, if not, you can get in contact with us, and, and we'll try to answer these a, um, a little so further than that. Yeah, than yeah, we have left. yeah. Um, then we have one. There are a number of mm -hmm. uh, black-owned businesses, but I, I'm cautious about starting to name them because yeah. if you miss one right. or two, right. you know, that's not fair right. either. Right. But, uh, right. I mean, we, we encourage through our economic development department, mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. through our job creation grants. Uh, you know, we, we encourage you know anybody that's willing to come here and have a business and uh, you know make it as easy for them as we possibly can. Okay. I guess the question is: Is there a place? I don't know if on the county website or whatever that would list these businesses. 
Is there anything out there? Because it would be kind of nice to know. I, I mean, how many people know, uh, even even of our hue, that there are out there? Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, there's a couple you named. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> I'm sitting there going, oh, OK. So, you know, there may be people that don't even know they're out there. You know, it'd be nice to have that somewhere where people could see that, too. When I think under the uh, federal regulations, when they say minority-owned businesses, mm -hmm. It includes women, mm -hmm. it includes minorities, right. mm -hmm. whatever. Yes. So I right. think as yeah. long as we followed those federal right. guidelines to right. where we're not taking just one, one right. group of people. Right. Right. And yes. yeah, right. so yeah, I can talk to uh, Kimberly Marshall as our economic development director and they have okay. a whole page on, on you know, grants and, and job incentives mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. We could include something on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sure, I'll talk to her about that. That's a good idea. Facebook does have okay. some negatives, but there is positives. And one positive thing is in one of the groups, mm -hmm. I can't even remember at this point, they do they have listed that. Then you have people in opposition of listing those things out, so you can't really win, but. <laughs> it's a start, we're trying somewhere. Right. All right. Uh, two more and then we're, we're, we're done. Uh, this one is from Nate, I wanna say Stroher, S-T-O-H-R-E-R. -E um, he says, I support defunding the police and moving those dollars to social services as a replacement of the overreaching power giving to those who carry badges. I don't think their power is kept well enough in check by the local government administration. They have been taught the first step to take is violence, even in peaceful situation, and that everyone and everything is a threat to them and that is acceptable to act out in these situations rather than acting with compassion and understanding. Police are not trained well enough to handle the complex topics of mental health and seeing as that is not their area of expertise. They should only be called on for criminal matters, matters and social service workers should be handling the majority of calls. So I think his was just a comment and really not so much of a question. Um, he was just making a comment on what he thought. Well, again, I, I would take a bit of an issue, though. Uh, if you look at the five demonstrations we had here, mm -hmm. they were all peaceful, yes. and officers did not exert any amount of force, uh, nor were there any arrests or any, any concerns that couldn't be mm -hmm. quickly diffused. Mm -hmm. So whether he's observing that in other areas uh, I, you know, I can't attest to, but I know what happened here. I was up there, we were walking together, um, and what he described was not seen I at the Medina demonstrations. Yeah, I don't think his, his comments are reflective of the Medina Police mm -hmm. Department. Okay, okay. And then the last one is from um, Pam Miller, and she says, many African American residents and or visitors to Medina recount stories of being stopped for DWD, driving while black. In the reports on traffic stops, is there any evidence in the police's race bias reports that African Americans are disproportionately, compared to the population of Medina, stopped for minor traffic offenses in Medina? That's her, that's her first question. Um, do we have anything on that? We do collect that data approximately a year ago. We updated our report management system. Uh, the system we had prior to this, we weren't able to track that data. Uh, so since one year ago, we've uh, almost a year ago, we've been able to track that data and we have been tracking it. Once we get a good data sample, we'll be able to, to take a look at that and evaluate that data. Uh, the key word is disproportionately. I, I don't know what that would be. I don't know what that definition of disproportionately okay. in terms of uh, the ratio would be, whether it's it's 15% is disproportionate. Okay. Uh, again, she, she wants to compare it to the uh, population rate, uh, the minority population rate based on the, the last census in the city of Medina. The, the issue is is that we don't have walls in the city of Medina, so people are free to travel to and from. Mm -hmm. We are the county seat. Uh, we're, we're the center of county operations. 
and uh, we are sandwiched between Akron and Cleveland, so it, it, mm -hmm. it does have a, a significant uptick in population during the day, during business hours mm -hmm. and in the evening. So I think we'll collect that data and we'll see where that, that data leads us once we analyze it. Um, preliminarily, we were looking at around 8% minority stops mm -hmm. okay. in that range, 8 to 8 to 10%. Okay. Okay. Mayor, you're... You're good? Yeah, I think he answered. Okay. The last one, I don't know if we can answer it. Um, I'll read it. I don't know if this pertains to us, but it says the number of non white youths in the juvenile detention center is disproportionately higher than the number of white youths, even when you subtract the number who might be from outside Medina County. In, 2009, in 2019, 22% of the male juveniles were African American, Hispanic, or other, and 26% of the females. Compare that to the non-white population of Medina of barely 7%. Can you talk about why that is the case? And I don't think we handle that, do we, Mayor yeah, Hamwell? The city does not oversee the juvenile detention center, but but the county police, mm -hmm. not just the city of Medina. Mm -hmm. So every police agency in Medina County feeds mm -hmm. um, feeds the uh, persons that are housed there. Mm -hmm. um, most of the persons that are housed there mm -hmm. have to be approved by the court or placed there by the court. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it, with a juvenile, it may not even be a criminal offense. Mm -hmm. uh, so with a juvenile, there's, there's such a thing as unruly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not criminal, but if m mom and dad can't keep control of, of the uh, young uh, man or, or woman uh, and, and the court can't get the, the young person to abide by the court's orders, maybe they have them on probation or you have to follow the rules at home and they don't do that, and sometimes they have to place them there to kind of get their attention and mm -hmm. try to get them back on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been my experience in Medina County that um, none of our judges want to incarcerate people or keep people incarcerated, be it youth or adults. Um, what we want to do is try to get their lives back on the right track, be it get off the drugs, get the mental health uh, they need, um, get them to understand you can't be stealing other people's properties. And, and many times that can be done with, with probation, but if they violate those probation rules, then a lot of times they'll be sent to the jail, maybe for a short period of time, to try to get their attention with the judge that, look, we're serious about this. Every time I let you out, you, you do something wrong again. So either you're telling me you can't make it in society or, or um, you're, you're ready to get your life straightened out now. And they kind, they, they're kind of just trying to help them. I think we all are. We're just trying to help them get back on the right track. Okay. Okay. All right. Listen, that's the end of our questions. Anybody have any final questions, comments? Uh, one, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if we really addressed, but just curious with the training of, of the force, is there training as it relates to trying to identify people with mental illness? When, when they go out, is there any mental illness training for the officers also? Yes, sir, that, that goes back to that uh, crisis intervention crisis. training. And that's a program sponsored by Alternative Paths here in Medina County. And it's a, it's a week long school that the officers attend. There's a lot of role playing and, and they're trained to identify different types of mental issues, mental diagnoses. Okay, thank you. Yes. I do. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be six, but is there any sort of board or committee or coalition that, um, that's made up of community members and residents that go alongside of a uh, city or, or police? Um, I know like at, at my place of employment, um, we have a, a consist of 51% consumers, and then the other um, percentage is made up of community members. 
and um, that is so that the policies that we enforce directly affect the population we're serving. Does the city or police have, are we looking at something like that? Do we have something like that? Yes, and, and, and I wanted, yeah, I wanted to mention that before we wrapped up because it's it's uh, important to this conversation mm -hmm. is our policies and where our policies come from. So we're certified with the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board, and what that is is it's a state state level uh, board that's composed of community members, police officers, and attorneys, and they develop best practice policies uh, statewide. A and to be certified under this collaborative, you have to adopt these policies. And that's where you'll see a lot of reform or future reforms coming from. Uh, we've been a member of this. We were one of the first to be certified in the state back in 2015. And this originated from President Obama's uh, 21st Century Policing Task Force. And a byproduct of that task force is this collaborative. And that was started by uh, Governor Kasich back in 2015. So we're on the fourth generation of policies that are being pushed down to each certified department. So these are all vetted policies with community members, police, and they're, they're recognized as nationally known best practice when it comes to use of force, basically every piece of policy. Uh, these policies are adopted into what we call our Lexapol policy manual. And this, this manual, I, I spoke about it earlier, is a robust manual, it's 767 pages long. And the officers are trained on that manual daily. And, and it's by a feature called daily training bulletins. So the officers are presented on a computer, they log into the system and they're presented with a scenario. And they have to choose the appropriate answer based on our current policy. And what that does, it trains these uh, the officers daily on the specific policy. And we also also have a record that yes, that officer's been trained on that piece of use of force policy. But all of our policies are based on that, and they're all based on that Ohio collaborative that's developed with a partnership of police and community, and and that will continue to push down best practices. And we will see in the future some reforms. I, I expect a, uh, a policy out, outlawing or banning the, uh, the chokehold, that it'll be actually in policy. And that likely will be pushed down through that collaborative here in the next generation of, of policies that come down. Okay. I didn't know that. Thank okay. you. That's, that's good information. Good I just information. have one other question that I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> How are you doing, like, as a person, as a police officer, as a white police officer? I mean, honestly, like, it has to be hard. It's hard for me as an African-American woman raising two African-American children with African-American fathers and uncles who um, see this, and it's reflected back on me. But then I, I know that there's this whole other side. Um, so I'm just curious, how, how are you doing, too, Kenny? It, it's tough on us. It's tough on our officers because they, they come to work and they want to do the best job they can for their entire community, everybody in their community. They're here to help people. They're here to serve the city. And they see this nationally, and, and it's, it's bothersome to them. It's bothersome to me when we see the videos that, that are being played out on the news consistently. Um, so, so it's it's tough for them, but but we're working through it, and uh, they come to come to work every day, just come to do the best that they can. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody good? I think it's new to all of us. Uh, in closing, um, I I struggle, and when I say struggle, I mean not like I get up in the morning and have all these issues, but um, this is this is the real life that we're facing. Uh, on top of this, we have the COVID we have to deal with. Uh, our churches aren't open. You know, people want to come to church and, and, and we can. We're still trying to social distance and do all of that. Um, so it, it makes us realize that there's just a lot being poured into everybody's plate. Um, so I think for me, I look at things uh, faith-based. That's how I walk. That's how I live. That's, that's the only thing I know uh, where other people may not see it the way that I see it. Uh, and I understand that. Um, so that's why we have meetings like this where we can come and be social and talk about it and look at it from different sides and look at everybody's point. Um, that's why uh, on this coming Friday, uh, the churches in the city of Medina, uh, we want to bag our police department. Um, we want to support 
support them and let them know that even though all of this is going on and police in general is being talked about, uh, that we stand behind you guys. Uh, we stand behind our mayor and the force. So all the churches in Medina, uh, we say, um, let's feed them lunch. Uh, how does that look? We were talking about that yesterday. Um, you're probably going to have to invite some city people to come and help you guys eat uh, <laughs> because you're probably going to have more food than what you know to do with. Um, every church is doing their own thing. Uh, and at 12 noon, we're coming to the police department and we're dropping off everything that we have because we want to say we love you and we support you. We're behind you. We know it's tough on y'all. We know it's tough. We know you're walking on eggshell and trying to do what's right. But we want you to know that we do love you. We support you. Um, so you're, you're probably going to have food all over the place. So you may want to invite people, the city workers, and everybody come. And you guys do what you want to do with the food at the end of the day. Um, but I know just from Second Baptist alone, you're, you're getting a lot of food. I'm trying to tell you. Um, so we pray that, that that's a sign that that would encourage you and your workers to say, job well done uh, and to you to work alongside you and to work alongside the mayor is is a is a great opportunity for me um, not only as a man but a black man and that people in the medina can say it can happen uh, people think it can't but it, it can when you sit down at the table and you lay your differences aside and you talk about what really matters it, it makes a difference and it makes me proud to say um, that i live here in medina uh, that I'm a pastor here in Medina, that I can make a difference here in Medina if we stand together, and I believe it will work. So this is probably just the first of one uh, virtual meeting that we had, and I pray that our community that watched this, that it would help them. If they have questions, um, they can call the police department uh, and leave them. They can call the mayor's department, leave them. They can email us and say, hey, listen, now that I've seen this, I want to talk about this, this, this. Um, the preachers, the pastors are getting together again. Next Wednesday, we're going to sit down, pray, talk about some things. So I, I see a difference here um, only for the fact that we are talking. I think that's that's a lot. We're, we're making a difference. It's not just the mayor and the chief. It's not just the mayor and the preachers. It's we're all sitting down at the round table and saying, what can we do to make a difference in Medina? Uh, and I think it's awesome. Amen. I just want to say right. real quick, because I am mm -hmm. looking at Facebook, that mm -hmm. it, it's um, people look at you and they say, Pastor Ruffin, you're a pastor. So it's different for me. I, your story is not my story. But I would say to um, people watching today that if you do have a concern, not to allow um, your personal bias and your personal prejudice to prohibit you from moving forward and developing these relationships with our officers and with our governor because our government. Because if we don't do that, then our voices won't be heard. Um, I. I always think about my kids and if Jacoby sits there and throws a temper tantrum, I'm going to let him sit there and throw a temper tantrum. It's not going to get anywhere. But if uh, sit, if he says, Mama, this is what I want, this is what I need, then guess what? I'm going to give it to him a little bit better. And so I think that by sitting down, having these conversations, being honest, because we've had some honest conversations behind closed doors, mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. asked each other these mm -hmm. questions about mm -hmm. Personally, how do you feel about racism mm -hmm. and, and experiences and what are you doing to hold your police uh, officers accountable and what are you doing for our city mayor? Um, we've had those conversations and anybody can. I mean, we're not special, I, I'm kind of special, but we're not special. <laughs> we're not special in the sense that no one else can do these things because we have a very open community with really great leaders here and I feel fortunate to be able to be here, but it doesn't take away from the real issues that are happening, um, but it does put us all on the right path. And so I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, and, I, and I do feel blessed to be a part of this community. I too, Pastor Ruffin, thank, thank you, you for, for organizing this forum. I think it's really important that we sit down and have these conversations. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how I got here, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I did. And, and like Ashley said, I think I it's, a, it's a, yes, he does. <laughs> I, I think it's a personal thing, as she says. Um, we have to look within ourselves personally and say, um, don't, don't let me speak for you, but speak for yourself. Um, that's what I did. I, I came to you, um, and I came seriously. I mean, I want to know where... I'm living in this city. How are you protecting me? What do you, I did. I came with the hard questions. I went to the mayor. You know, can you find some time to just talk with me? There's some things I need to, and they, they found that time. And I think people, they can find your email. They could find your email and shoot you a question and say, Mayor, listen. The next, the next day, actually. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I did. I was like, because we told them it was important. 
Let's not, let's yes, not sir. wait. Yes, sir. And we did it. We did it just like that. And people need to know that they don't have to speak through me or through you or through you. They can email you and you will reply back and say, hey, listen, this is what it is. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. You did it. We made appointments. Some people kept them. Some people missed them. And we just kept moving on. And that's where we are in this city. Your feelings will never come out unless you sit down and you talk about them. So I appreciate you guys' time. Uh, we'll probably meet again somewhere. But I, I thank God for the movement um, that we're doing just to make our city better. We don't know what other cities look like, um, but we know what Medina looks like and what we would love for it to look like. And I think by the grace of God, it will. It will. Amen? Amen. I keep saying amen. I keep thinking we in church. Y'all you know, got to forgive me on that. Okay, everybody good? Yep. All right, let me pray us out and then we're going, to, we're going to go. Father, we thank you once again for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you, God, for this time that you've allowed us to come and sit down and, and talk and to share with our community. Uh, I believe where you want us to go according to, to your word. So we thank you for the boldness. We thank you for the courage. We pray, God, for our mayor. We pray for our, our, our police chief. We pray for our police officers and those that are in authority, God, that you would grant them grace and wisdom and knowledge to do the things that you have called them to do. We thank you for allowing us to be who we are through you. So we pray that you would continue to bless us and keep us in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Facebook, for watching with us.